Hello, Judith. Thank you for taking in charge this um, this webinar. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Javier. Okay, thank you. Maybe Judith doesn't have all maybe. Yeah, maybe. Well, good afternoon. I have no idea if anybody is hearing anybody else. I mean, what do you think? I'm just waiting for some sign of light from the organization. Hi, Paolo. Uh, I think uh, Judith uh, has some problem with this with her audio. Okay. All right. So we just wait until Judy get fixed the Dutch technology. Is someone talking now? Oh, wonderful. Yes. Now we can hear you. I think she can hear us. So, so Judith? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. OK. Good, 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 good. Got it. Fantastic. All right. So now everything is fine. And uh, so first of all, we wish to thank Judith for accepting to give a to share with us uh, expertise in chondrogenic tumor within the setting of the cell net consortium. And as you know, well, Judy, in addition to be a very, very long time personal friend, you just like a queen of chondrogenic tumor. She works in Leiden and Leiden has been the mecca for years and years of chondrogenic tumors research. She runs uh, there, her, there uh, of course, uh, specific expertise on uh, on bone and so bone and soft tissue tumors, and uh, I'm sure that she will be able now to take us through a rather extensive journey through the news uh, that, in a way, has been incorporated in the recent years in these very very complicated fields of pathology. So again, Judith, welcome, and thank you for accepting to share some of your time with us.
Thank you, Paolo, for the introduction. It is my pleasure. Now I'm trying to share my screen again. And I hope you can still hear me. Do you see my screen? Yes. And you can hear me? Yes. Very good. We're all set. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to uh, guide you through some of the... Oh. Okay, now it works. To uh, chronogenic tumors of bone and give you an update on uh, how we diagnose uh, these lesions. So chronogenic tumors are a little bit reshuffled in the latest uh, WHO classification. Uh, and this is the list that we currently uh, adhere to. Uh, so we have three categories, the benign, the intermediate locally aggressive and the malignant uh, tumors. Um, and if you look at the incidence, then the, the chondromas and the osteochondromas are about 60% of all benign bone tumors. So they're actually relatively uh, frequent. And the uh, um, chondrosarcoma, so the conventional ones, uh, grade one, two, and three, and atypical cartilaginous tumor together form about 10 to 20% of all the malignant uh, bone tumors. So actually they're quite uh, common. Um, and as for all bone tumors, it is imperative to have uh, not only the morphology, but also the clinical and radiological information. Has to have a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, the pathologist is also using some immunohistochemistry, chemistry, but for cartilage tumors, it's not a lot. Uh, and sometimes molecular analysis. But for cartilage tumors, the, the clinical and radiological information is uh, crucial uh, to come to a correct diagnosis. And sometimes it's even uh, impossible to diagnose cartilage lesions without radiology. And I will show some examples of that. So to start off with the benign cartilage tumors, uh, the most common ones are enchondroma and osteochondroma. So simply put, enchondroma is in the medulla of the bone and it's caused by IDH1 and IDH2 mutations. Uh, osteochondromas is lo are located on the surface of the bone and they are caused by germline mutations in EXT1 and EXT2 in patients with multiple osteochondromas or somatic alterations. So to start off with osteochondroma, this is the epidemiology for solitary osteochondroma. And as you can see, they mostly uh, arise around the knee region. That's the most common uh, location. And uh, these tumors uh, stop growing at puberty. Yeah, so the main uh, incidence is the highest just before uh, the closure of the growth plates. And there is a slight uh, male uh, predominance. So osteochondromas are typically composed of um, uh, a stalk, which is covered by a cartilaginous cap. And uh, the hallmark is that the medulla of the underlying bone is continuous with the medulla within the stalk. And then also the cortex is going through and then it's covered by a cartilage cap and some fibrous uh, tissue or periosteum or perichondrium, whatever you like to call it. And here you can see an example. So this is how we get these uh, excisions as pathologists. And when you cut through them, you can see the, the bluish cartilaginous cap and the stalk that is mainly consisting of medullary bone. Here's another example. And this is just to show you that it is very important for pathologists to document the size of the cartilaginous cap. And I will show you later why that is so important. And this is the way how you do it. So you, you measure the cartilaginous cap perpendicular to the, uh, the tide mark or, or where the, the cartilage goes into the bone. And so this is the way to measure it. And it should always be documented uh, in the gross uh, workup. So this is the histology of osteochondroma. Um, here again, the, the medullary bone and then the cartilage cap and then the perichondrium. So typically three layers. And then the uh, osteochondroma itself, if you zoom in, it's uh, uh, containing uh, cartilage cells in different areas of uh, development. So uh, the more stem-like cells, the proliferating chondrocytes, and then the hypertrophic chondrocytes, and then these hypertrophic chondrocytes also here, uh, they go into, um, uh, they calcify. Um, uh, and this is very reminiscent of what we see in the normal growth plate. Yeah? So again, the columns of proliferating chondrocytes hypertrophic chondrocytes, and then here calcification and, and turnover into bone. The only thing is that in osteochondroma, it's usually much more disorganized than it is in the normal growth plate. So osteochondromas can be broad based and then they're cut off uh, the bone surface for uh, quite a bit, um, or they can be pedunculated and then they have this nice uh, stalk. 
So as I said, osteochondromas can be uh, multiple in uh, about one in every six patients. Um, uh, patients have multiple lesions and an example is shown here in the x-ray, quite an extensive example with multiple uh, stalks that are covered by these cartilaginous cap. And this is a reformatted 3D CT image and you can see how extensive that can be. And about 60 to 80% of these patients uh, have a hereditary form uh, of multiple osteochondromas. So um, the incidence of that is about one in 50,000. Uh, it's an autosomal dominant uh, disease um, and it's genetically heterogeneous. So there are two genes described, the ext one gene and chromosome 8q and the ext 2 gene at chromosome 11p. And there is quite some clinical uh, variability in uh, how this uh, uh, can present. Huh? I showed you in the previous uh, slide a very extensive disease. And here you can see that it is a little less extensive, but still you can recognize multiple osteochondromas and what these patients also typically have is this bowing of the, the lower arm, which you can also see in this uh, figure. So as I said, it's caused by mutations in uh, either EXT1 or EXT2 in uh, patients with multiple osteochondromas in the germline and in solitary cases there is uh, inactivation of the EXT genes at the uh, somatic level. So the EXT genes are uh, glycosyl transferases and they um, uh, are involved in the elongation of these heparin sulfate side chains. And so they, they stick these, these sugar chains, uh, making these long forms. Uh, and these um, uh, are attached to a protein core and then these are called the heparin sulfate proteoglycans. So the uh, EXT proteins are involved in the generation of these uh, heparin sulfate proteoglycans side chains. And uh, these um, uh, heparin sulfate proteoglycans, the most important ones are shown over here. So syndicon, perlecon, CD44, and then a specific splice variant of that in glipecon. Most of them are uh, uh, membrane bound and some of them are in the extracellular matrix. And these um, uh, sugar chains and these proteoglycans are very important for signaling of Indian hedgehog of WIND, TGF-beta and BMP. And this is shown over here. These are all crucial morphogens in the normal growth plate signaling. I showed you previously that osteochondromas look very much like uh, the normal growth plate. Uh, and here you can see how that functionally works. So the EXT proteins are uh, inactivated. So um, there are less uh, heparin sulfate proteoglycans available. And that affects the diffusion of Indian hedgehog to its receptor patched. And that um, uh, negatively affects the normal a growth plate a paracrine signaling as it is over here. So Indian hedgehog patched uh, PTHR1 uh, BCL2. And so this signaling pathway is disturbed uh, when there are mutations in uh, EXT. So how does that lead to osteochondroma formation? Uh, so this, this paracrine signaling is, uh, as I said, important for the, the maintenance of the normal growth plate, but it's also important for the uh, formation of the bony collar. Uh, so the, the cortical uh, area surrounding uh, the growth plate. And when both copies of EXT are inactivated, uh, then this, this bony collar is not properly formed uh, and then the Indian hedgehog signaling uh, uh, is disturbed. And uh, that is the reason why this bony collar is not properly formed. And then these growth plate cells that have uh, the inactivation of EXT can grow out and form this uh, osteochondroma, which contains mutant cells uh, in addition to wild type uh, cells. So what is the most important uh, thing of diagnosing osteochondroma? That is that these patients are at risk of developing secondary peripheral chondrosarcoma, and that occurs in about one to 5% of all uh, tumors. Um, and most of them uh, will transform into a secondary peripheral chondrosarcoma, uh, which is uh, in 90% of the cases low grade, so an atypical cartilaginous tumor or chondrosarcoma grade one. And there is very rare case reports where uh, osteosarcomas or fibrosarcomas developed within the stalk of an uh, osteochondroma. So the most important uh, thing to realize is the, uh, the progression to peripheral chondrosarcoma that can occur. 
So an important differential diagnosis, and I cannot discuss all of them because of the time, but this is one that I, I would like to discuss because we see it very often in uh, consultation. Uh, so this is a subungual exostosis. So it's typically located near the, uh, the nail bed, which is for a conventional osteochondroma is a very unusual location and hardly ever occurs there occasionally in patients with multiple osteochondromas. Uh, but the finger bones are hardly ever affected by uh, conventional osteochondroma. So that's something to realize. And also the morphology is a little bit different. Huh? So you can see that there is a hint of growth plate uh, over here. Again, it's disorganized, but the cartilage is different. So the cartilage is much more uh, fibrillary or fibrous as compared to the hyaline cartilage that we saw in conventional osteochondroma. And here you can see these fibers in the um, uh, extracellular matrix of these uh, lesions. So it's a, a, a histologically uh, different and also the clinical presentation is different. And these tumors are characterized by a specific translocation. So to move on with enchondroma, so that's the other uh, uh, rather common uh, benign uh, cartilaginous bone tumor. So these are not at the surface, but in the medulla of the bone, as you can see over here, you can see a lytic uh, lesion uh, because there is no normal bone, but there is cartilage over here. Um, it's 10 to 25% of all benign bone tumors, uh, but the ins ins exact incidence is unknown because it's very often found radiologically uh, uh, when there is an X-ray made for other reasons. Often these tumors are small, smaller than three centimeters. They have a preference for the uh, small uh, finger bones. Um, and the risk of malignant transformation is a bit lower than for osteochondroma. It's less than 1%. And here you can see typical histology with calcification. It's a very boring picture, I used to say, with very few uh, chondrocytes. So the epidemiology, as I said, it predominantly affects the, the finger uh, bones and the foot bones, so the small bones. Uh, the age range is a much more variable, uh, also uh, at, at older age than uh, osteochondroma, and um, uh, it also affects a female slightly more often. Histology, boring, uh, very few cells, lots of matrix and uh, some calcification, as you can see over here. And the typical thing described uh, very early on by Mira is the encasement. So the bone tries to encapsulate the, um, um, the, the growth of an enchondroma by depositing bones surrounding the nodules of the enchondroma. So there is a hint of, of uh, um, a lamellar bone surrounding these um, uh, nodules, which is a sign of very slow growth. So there is time for the bone to try to encapsulate the growth of this lesion by Mira called uh, encasement. So enchondromas are mostly solitary, uh, but occasionally they can occur a multiple. Um, and this, um, this syndrome is called enchondromatosis. And it has multiple uh, variants. And the most common forms of enchondromatosis are Ollier disease and Mofuchi syndrome. And then there are very few other extremely rare uh, subtypes that I will not discuss today. So I will discuss only Ollier and Mofuchi. Uh, and you can see here an example of multiple uh, enchondromas in the finger bones. And here also the gross uh, specimen of uh, some of these lesions. Here you can see multiple of these cartilage islands within uh, the bone. Uh, these are caused by somatic mosaic mutations in either the IDH1 or the IDH2 gene. Um, and this is shown over here. So it's non-hereditary. Huh? So in contrast to multiple osteochondroma, which was a germline mutation and is hereditary, Oye and Mafuchi are non-hereditary. Huh? So the mutation occurs after uh, gastrulation in a subset of the, the body cells uh, that carry the mutation. And then uh, upon a development uh, in some parts of the body, um, a subset of the cells will carry uh, the mutation. Um, and uh, this is shown over here. So here is uh, uh, immunist chemistry for the R132H mutation uh, in uh, uh, enchondroma. Uh, so all the mutant cells uh, are stained um, uh, brown. And then you can see that some of the lining cells, some of the endothelial cells, and a few of the uh, osteocytes, uh, some of them are wild type, but some of them uh, clearly uh, are uh, expressing the mutant uh, protein, and also here in the endothelial cells. 
And so that um, uh, is uh, a confirmation that uh, that is a somatic mosaicism. And so a subset of the body cells have the mutation and then they can grow out to uh, enchondroma. Enchondromatosis, um, um, uh, as I said, multiple cartilaginous lesions and uh, often unilateral uh, predominance. And what I showed you in the previous slide, you, you may understand how that happened. Uh, some parts of the body are more affected than uh, others. Non-hereditary is a rare disease. The risk of malignant transformation is quite high. Uh, uh, it was less than 1% in solitary enchondroma, but it can be up to 46% in OEA uh, disease. Uh, but it depends on the location. The finger bones are less prone to malignant transformation than the long bones. And this is an example of a malignant transformation in a long bone. And also you can see here uh, malignant transformation. This is the age distribution. Again, these are young uh, patients uh, that are diagnosed. Enchondromatosis Mafuchi syndrome is basically the same as uh, OEA disease. The only difference is that in addition to multiple enchondromas, these patients also have uh, vascular lesions. And most of these are spindle cell hemangiomas. And an example is shown uh, over here. And this you can also see uh, clinically, as uh, you can see here, the, the, the vascular tumors. Uh, uh, so the bluish uh, lesions are shining through also here. Uh, and at x-ray, you can see these flibolids um, uh, indicative of um, uh, a vascular lesion. And uh, other than that, it's very similar to um, uh, OEA disease. The only thing is that the risk of malignant transformation is even higher, up to 60%. So why is it important to recognize enchondromatosis? Uh, well, the risk of malignant transformation, of course, is the most important uh, reason. And another reason why pathologists need to be aware of whether lesions are multiple or not is that the uh, criteria that you use to diagnose a malignancy are different in the context of enchondromatosis as compared to uh, solitary uh, cases. And you accept more cellularity, more binucleated cells, and more cytonuclear atypia in uh, uh, lesions uh, that do not go through the cortex um, than you would um, accept in uh, solitary enchondroma. And that is because these lesions do not behave in a malignant uh, way, even if they have uh, more cellularity, more binucleated cells and more atypia. That also means that the distinction between enchondroma and uh, an atypical cartilaginous tumor or chondrosarcoma grade one in the context of enchondromatosis is uh, for pathologists very difficult uh, if you do not have the clinical information. So you, it needs to be assessed in a multidisciplinary team and you need to be aware of the radiology and whether a lesion goes through the cortex or not, because right? that's the most important criterion to, to distinguish uh, a grade one, for instance, from uh, Encondro in this context. So multidisciplinary uh, uh, assessment. So the function of IDH is entirely different from uh, what we discussed for EXT. And so uh, IDH is involved in the uh, TCA cycle, uh, which is shown over here, the citric acid uh, cycle, and it converts isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate. Huh? So the, in the mitochondrion producing energy uh, for the cell. When there is a mutation in uh, IDH, then alpha ketoglutarate is not converted, um, uh, or isocitrate, alpha ketoglutarate is further converted to D2HT, um, uh, which is an oncometabolite, uh, and which is very lowly present in cells. If there is no mutation, but there is, if there is a mutant enzyme, then the levels of D2HT uh, rise uh, very highly. And this D2HT competes uh, with alpha ketoglutarate in cells, and then it uh, inhibits DNA demethylation, uh, causing hypermethylation, and it inhibits histone demethylation. So then how do uh, enchondromas arise? So what is the uh, hypothesis? So this is uh, uh, what I just showed to you and, and uh, this, this high levels of D2HG resulting from the mutant enzymes uh, cause epigenetic changes uh, in the cells in the way I just described. And the idea is that for mesenchymal stem cells in order to, uh, and normally they should differentiate into osteocytes have forming the normal bone. Uh, that instead they uh, prefer to differentiate into uh, chondrocytes yeah, so that it, it affects uh, the normal differentiation and that that would lead to the, all these cartilaginous islands uh, that occur in the bone. 
And proof for that uh, is shown over here. So uh, here we had uh, mesenchymal stem cells and we added the oncometabolite to these mesenchymal stem cells and then these um, uh, let them differentiate into uh, the osteogenic lineage. And you can see that the control nicely differentiates, it turns red, it mineralizes. Well, in the presence of D2HC, the osteogenic differentiation is inhibited. And this is also confirmed in this assay. And then when you take the mesenchymal stem cells, add the D2HG and have them differentiate towards the cartilage lineage, you can see that that is preferred. So there is more cartilaginous differentiation and there is less uh, osteogenic differentiation. Here you see uh, the H&E, you can see in blue, has so there are proteoglycans being deposited. And this is collagen two, and you can see uh, a chondrogenic matrix, uh, which is more properly formed than in the control. Uh, situation. This was also confirmed in zebrafish. And so these are the normal zebrafish and these are, um, uh, so these are the normal zebrafish. And here we added the D2HG to the, uh, the yolk sac and the water of the, uh, the zebrafish. And then you can see that um, uh, normally they develop the vertebrate rings. And when there is a D2HG, they do not develop these vertebrate rings. And this is also quantified over here. So inhibition of osteogenic differentiation and promotion of chondrogenic differentiation leading to enchondroma formation. All right, periosteal chondroma. Um, it's a very uh, rare subtype of um, uh, chondroma. It occurs at the bone surface, uh, less than 2% of all chondromas. And it also has mutations in the same IDH gene in about 70% of the cases. And here you can see a diagram. It occurs at the um, uh, surface of the bone. Slightly more common in males, uh, young, uh, to, uh, yeah, young patients. And it has a preference for the, uh, at the finger bones uh, again, but it can also occur at the, the long bones. So periosteal chondroma shown over here. So typically the cortex, the underlying cortex is intact. And then here you can see the cartilage uh, tumor and there is usually some calcification mm -hmm. surrounding it. Um, so here you can see the, uh, 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 we can see some calcifications, it's moderately cellular, a bit more cellular than uh, enchondromas. And so that's why you need to know where your tissue comes mm -hmm. from. But it's, uh, if it's in a periosteal uh, location, you accept more cellularity. So chondromyxoid fibroma, um, uh, typically uh, radiologically the cookie bite uh, appearance has yeah, so a lytic lesions with some uh, sclerotic uh, margin, slightly more common in males, and it has a preference for the metaphysis uh, of the bone, uh, and especially of the lower uh, extremity, as you can see over here, it likes also the, the knee region. And this is the age distribution, uh, predominantly in young patients, but it can also uh, occur in elderly patients. So can anyone mute the microphone because I hear someone. Okay, uh, the histology. So it's typically um, multinodular. Uh, as you can see over here, you can see some cysts and you can see these bluish uh, areas and then the edges of the, uh, the lobuli are usually highly cellular. Uh, this you can also see over here. So it is more cartilage-like. And so there's a lot of matrix over here. And the cellularity increases near the periphery of the lobules. Uh, and there the cells become a bit more rounded, as you can see over here. So here are the stellate cells in the matrix. And at the edge, it's more rounded and more cellular. So a typical lobulated architecture. You can see multinucleated giant cells. And these rounded cells are typically in the more cellular uh, areas. So this was um, uh, the genetic finding that was published in 2014. And so uh, chondromyxoid fibroma is typically characterized by rearrangement of the GRM1 uh, gene um, with various fusion partners leading to upregulation of the GRM1, as you can see over here in um, uh, chondromyxoid fibroma and not in control uh, tumors. So GRM1 stands for the glutamate receptor 1. Uh, leads to aberrant glutamate signaling, and uh, the signaling pathway is well known in the nervous system, but it's not yet properly understood how this leads to chondromyxoid fibroma formation in bone when it's rearranged. The nice thing is, so we tried several antibodies uh, at the time in 2014, and we could not find a good antibody that we could use as a diagnostic marker. 
but recently uh, in collaboration with a group in, in Stanford there, um, we published that there is a nice uh, marker for GRM1 uh, that uh, shows very nice uh, immunistic chemical results, as you can see over here in the more typical uh, areas and also in the more atypical areas. And it's negative in all the other uh, bone tumors that we uh, tested that may pop up in the differential diagnosis. So it's very specific. There was only one case uh, that was negative and all other CMF cases were positive. All right, chondroblastoma uh, is typically located in the epiphysis of the bone, as you can see over here. Uh, it's one of the few that has this very specific typical uh, location. Uh, and it also has radiologically a lot of edema surrounding the lesion, which you can see over here. It has a preference for a young uh, males, uh, usually uh, below the age of 20. It's a preferential um, uh, age where it occurs, and it uh, occurs around the knee region, uh, but also in other uh, areas. So this is the typical uh, histological uh, imaging. And so giant cells uh, can be very uh, prominent. Uh, and then in between, there are these, these rounded uh, cells uh, that are uh, more angulated than you can see in a uh, giant cell tumor of bone, for instance. And then there's this typical uh, matrix uh, in between that has this typical uh, chicken wire uh, calcification, these, these fine lines that you can see over here. If you decalcify too much, you may uh, miss that. Uh. So the mutations described in chondroblastoma are this, uh, very similar to what has been described in giant cell tumor of bone. Um, and this is from the uh, paper where it was uh, uh, published from the Sanger uh, group uh, in 2014. So in um, uh, giant cell tumor of bone, the, the G34W mutation in uh, the histone uh. 43 uh, gene is the most uh, common one, while in uh, chondroblastoma, uh, mutations predominantly affect the K36M position, both of the H3F3B gene as well as the H3F3A gene. And these two genes are uh, uh, paralog, so they um, uh, encode the same histone 3.3 protein. Um, and as you can see over here, so this, this is the chondroblastoma, had a, the green bar predominantly affecting the K36 uh, position and predominantly H3F3B, B, occasionally H3F3A. Here you can see that the morphology can be very similar, as so it can pop up in the differential diagnosis. So you need your radiology, and where is it exactly located? Uh, you need to look at the mononuclear cells to make the distinction. Um, and now we also have this very nice uh, immunohistochemistry, as there is immunohistochemistry for G34W in the giant cell tumor of bone, but there is also immunohistochemistry to detect the K36M mutation, both in H3F3A and in H3F3B in uh, chondroblastoma. And this is a, a, an example. And what you can nicely see is that the giant cells are uh, negative, and so they are reactive. Uh, and all these mononuclear cells, and so these are the neoplastic cells, they are positive for the K36M mutation. So very nice, a very specific uh, immuno for the mutant uh, protein. So very helpful for uh, pathologists. And it's so specific that you do not need to do a mutation analysis anymore. All right, so, so far we discussed all the benign uh, tumors, so now we move on to the uh, malignant ones, uh, chondrosarcoma. So this is uh, from the Rizzoli uh, atlas, and uh, you can see that the central and the peripheral, uh, so the conventional chondrosarcomas are the most common one, about, uh, um, 40, uh, about three quarters of the, the tumors. After that, the differentiated uh, uh, chondrosarcoma is most common, and it's mostly central, and very, very rarely it can be a peripheral. And then there are a few rare subtypes consisting of clear cell periosteal and mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. So we will discuss all of them. So uh, to start off with the conventional ones, peripheral versus central. So peripheral are much more rare than central. Peripheral again at the bone surface and they actually always arise in a uh, previous uh, osteochondroma as I've shown you before. Well, the central ones can also be uh, a primary. They do not always have an enchondroma as a precursor, and they occur in the medulla of the bone, as you can see over here. So 
conventional cartilaginous tumors in the bone uh, are a spectrum. Huh? So on one hand, we have the very lowly cellular lesions, as you can see over here. And on the other hand, we have the highly cellular lesions, as you can see over here. And basically, we can see under a microscope the whole spectrum in between. And that makes it very difficult to uh, draw a line on, on, on how to uh, diagnose uh, had all the different lesions within the spectrum. And so where do we draw the line? That's basically the question. Um, so this is the clinical, um, uh, how we clinically uh, approach them. Um, and these are the criteria that we use uh, to distinguish enchondroma from a grade one or conosarcoma or what we now call atypical cartilaginous tumor. We use a host bone entrapment and mucomixoid matrix. I will show you later on. And to distinguish a grade one from a grade two is the increased cellularity and mitosis. And also very importantly, radiologically, whether it goes through the cortex or not, is something that you also weigh uh, as a pathologist. And so this is uh, why we bother so much. And so the benign ones uh, have a very good outcome and you can leave there. You don't need to do anything. And the malignant ones, uh, and especially the grade three lesions have a very poor outcome and they can metastasize in up to 70% of the tumors. And so we need to, uh, within this spectrum, we need to uh, try to predict how these tumors will uh, behave. And so this is how they are treated. And so the malignant ones with unblocked resection, uh, these with curatage and local adjuvants, um, uh, unless they are located in the axial skeleton, but I will talk a bit more about that later on. So this is the terminology that we introduced in the 2013 classification. So atypical cartilaginous tumor slash conosarcoma grade one, uh, uh, defining an intermediate locally aggressive category. So that was 2013. Uh, in practice, we used it uh, like this. Uh, we said it was locally aggressive, but it was not meant, um, even though some people used it as such, as an intermediate between enchondroma and conosarcoma grade one, or some kind of borderline tumor. And that was uh, absolutely not what was meant in the 2013 classification, but it was not because it was added in the consensus was reached at the very last minute. So it was not really properly explained in the WHO Blue Book in 2013. So in 2020, uh, we had a chance to do it a little bit better, I hope. Uh, so, uh, and there we, we consulted also the orthopedic surgeons, uh, uh, radiologists, um, and uh, how we came to a proposal that is very similar to what we use for atypical lipomatous tumor. Um, and that is because the behavior of these lesions also depends on the location. So if it's in the appendicular uh, skeleton, uh, had a long bone, so the short uh, tubular bones, then a, a curatage can be easily performed and then the patient is more or less uh, cured. Um, uh, and that's why we think these should be defined as locally aggressive and not full-blown malignant. And that's why for these uh, lesions in the appendicular skeleton, we reserve the term atypical cartilaginous tumor. On the other hand, if they are in the axial skeleton, uh, in the pelvis or in the skull base, uh, histologically, can, they can look like uh, the same as an ACT or uh, what I just uh, defined. Uh, but still, um, it will be very difficult to, uh, um, um, uh, to cure the patient if they are in the um, uh, skull base, because uh, you simply cannot uh, get uh, everything out. But also in the um, the pelvis, for instance, they need more aggressive treatment than you would give in the lung bones. And so that's why in this uh, location, the axial skeleton, we define them as malignant and we now use the term condosarcoma grade one. And so histologically the same, uh, but depending on the location, we use different uh, terminology. And this is the scientific proof uh, for the reason uh, for, for, for the, uh, the change that we uh, made. And so here you can see that the ones in the axial skeleton behave uh, worse than the ones in the appendicular skeleton, uh, even though they may, may be morphologically uh, similar. Same here, as so the pelvis do uh, worse. And this is a very large uh, series from the Netherlands, from the, uh, the, register, the pathology registry. And these were stratified for tumor grade. And then you can see that the ones in the pelvis, the sacrum and the coccyx, um, have a, a higher risk um, uh, and a worse uh, outcome. And so this is the, uh, the basis for the different um, uh, terminology that we use. 
So to summarize, if you see a lesion like this, we see a cartilage and its tumor that looks moderately a low grade, but it goes, it permeates the pre-existing lamellar host bone, and so it grows infiltratively, so it's not an enchondroma anymore. Uh, and then it depends on the location, uh, what um, uh, term you use. And so if the, more, the radiology is like this, it's in the long bones, then we know that um, uh, acuritage and local adjuvants will be uh, uh, a good treatment. Uh, the outcome is better. Uh, and then we use the term atypical cartilaginous tumor. If on the other hand, uh, it's located in the the axial skeleton, uh, for instance, here in the sternum, we can see a cartilaginous a tumor, which uh, uh, destroys uh, the cortex a little bit. Um, and then uh, uh, we know that it uh, uh, should be treated with a, a resection um, uh, because it has a worse outcome, it behaves worse. Uh, and then we use the term conosocoma grade one. And so this is specifically for the flat bones, which includes the pelvis, the scapula, and the skull base. And, and that's um, another uh, warning I should make. So uh, in different uh, systems, for instance, the TNM uh, staging uses a different definition of the axial skeleton than is used in the WHO classification. And so this is what is used uh, uh, for the uh, terminology uh, change. So histological grading, I already alluded that, to that a little bit. So uh, grade one has a lot of uh, cartilaginous matrix, binucleated cells, but uh, usually no mitosis. Um, grade two, the cellularity increases. There is uh, more nuclear atypia, uh, but still it's okay. Uh, and occasionally you can see mitosis. Grade three is highly cellular. It's a much more mixoid. Um, uh, the atypia is more extensive. Mitosis can be seen. And uh, an important criteria that they use to distinguish grade two and grade three is the spindle cell changes that you can see at the, the periphery of the lobules. And so here in, in the spindle cell areas, it's more difficult to recognize that it is a cartilaginous tumor. So conventional central chondrosarcoma, here's an example where you can see it's very extensively uh, going in the medullary cavity of the bone. And you can see the scalloping uh, over here. So this is a typical um, uh, uh, gross uh, image. It has a preference for a male uh, patient, slightly, uh, a slight preference for male patients. This is the age distribution, so slightly older patients. And this is the uh, anatomical uh, distribution. So it likes uh, the long bones, but it also likes the, the pelvis. So you can imagine, hey, I showed you the, the, the spectrum. It can be difficult to um, uh, draw the line. And so it, uh, uh, it can be, uh, you can imagine that there is inter-observer variability depending on which pathologist is evaluating your uh, specimen. And this is shown over here. So on the left, you see the results of an American uh, study uh, looking at these uh, lesions. And this is uh, the results of a, a European a study that we did in the time of uh, Eurobonet uh, some time ago. Uh, and then you can see that uh, the kappa value, has, so the, the agreement is um, uh, not uh, uh, extensively uh, uh, perfect, uh, so to put it mildly. And then uh, here you can see that the, the differences are mainly found in uh, distinguishing enchondroma versus uh, the lower grade lesions, and not so much in uh, distinguishing the lower grade lesions from the more higher grade lesions. And this is, of course, important because this is the, the distinction between an unblock resection and a simple curatage. And more and more often, we do not get these enchondromas anymore under our, our microscopes because the radiologists more often uh, are, are able to predict behavior and, uh, um, um, and the await and see policy is also often uh, advocated, even for these lower grade. Uh, lesions. Uh, so the, the problem is solving itself a little bit, but still there is quite some interobservable variability that you should be aware of. So which criteria to use? Um, this was a study that we did in the past to see which, uh, based on outcome uh, uh, retrospectively, um, to see how we could best uh, distinguish these lesions. And then these are five criteria that are very important. Um, so high cellularity, uh, the presence of host bone entrapment or infiltrative growth, open chromatin, uh, more than 20% mucomyxoid matrix changes, and an age over 45 years uh, of age. 
these are all indicative of um, ACT or grade one over enchondroma. Uh, and uh, when you did a multivariable analysis, then these two were the most important. Uh, so the um, infiltrative growth and matrix changes. And then uh, most of the cases were correctly classified. So here to show again, so the infiltrative growth, so the entrapment of the pre-existing host bone uh, lamellae, as you can see over here, and the mucomixoid matrix changes, as you can see over here. Other features, increased cellularity has sometimes uh, uh, binucleated cells, as you can see over here, and also the open chromatin uh, is in favor of uh, ACT or chronosarcoma grade one, and also the binucleated cells, but it's all not, not all uh, black and white. So histological uh, scalloping uh, can be seen, but only if you have a resection specimen. Of course, you cannot see that in the curettage. Uh, here you can uh, nicely see that, uh, but that's some, a sign that uh, radiologists often use uh, to uh, have a preference for uh, ACT or chondrosarcoma grade one. Of course, when it breaks through the uh, cortex, and like for instance here, then it's quite obvious that it's uh, a malignant, and usually it's also of a higher grade when it does uh, go through the cortex like this. So then again, the criteria are depending on the context. I already mentioned uh, that when it uh, when a tumor is coming from a patient with OEA disease, the criteria are a bit different. And we accept more, um, uh, here is the histological spectrum, we accept more cellularity and more atypia than we would in uh, patients that have solitary lesions. So this is already uh, very difficult. So how to, where to draw the line. If it's in a phalanx, it's again different. I will show that later on. If it's in a periosteal location, I already showed you periosteal uh, chondroma, then you also accept more cellularity. Uh, and also in synovial chondromatosis, you accept higher cellularity. And so the criteria are context dependent and an additional factor to take into account is the age of the patient. So it's a very young patient. Again, you accept higher cellularity than you would in an elderly patient. So the multi-step genetic model, so I already uh, explained this part of the, uh, the, the scheme, so how we, uh, how we think that uh, enchondromas develop based on the IDH mutation. And then uh, for chondrosarcomas uh, with uh, highly complex genomes to arise within these enchondromas, additional uh, alterations are found, including P53 and the RB pathway, which are common in complex genomes, sarcomas, but also hedgehog signaling genes, uh, collagen 2, yeats 2, and NRAS. So chondrosarcoma of the phalanx is a very rare, uh, more often in the hands than uh, in the foot, um, uh, and has a preference for the proximal phalanx. Metastases are very rare when, it, uh, when a tumor is located in this uh, location, and therefore histological grading does not predict uh, the clinical behavior. And that's why uh, we do not apply histological grading to phalangeal localization. And it's, uh, there's a very sharp line in phalangeal um, uh, localization. We do not do histological grading while in the metacarpal or the metatarsal bone, uh, we use the uh, long bone criteria. So that's different. Um, then how to distinguish uh, benign from malignant. So uh, I just said that you cannot rely on cellularity and all those other criteria. Um, and the pre presence of mitosis is very important and whether or not there is a destruction uh, of the cortex or extension in the soft tissue. So when these criteria are there, uh, either radiologically or histologically, uh, then we diagnose um, uh, phalangeal chondrosarcoma and we do not do histological grading. So to move on, secondary peripheral chondrosarcoma, this is the uh, epidemiology, the patients are slightly younger than central uh, chondrosarcoma, male uh, preference, uh, long bones uh, predominantly, but also the pelvis and the scapula are uh, favored. Uh, and again, like for osteochondroma, it's very important to measure the cartilaginous cap. Uh, and it should be measured again, perpendicular to the cartilaginous cap as is indicated uh, over here always at the bone surface, always secondary to an osteochondroma. Uh, again, we use the same uh, uh, principle. If it's in the axial location, we call it chondrosarcoma grade one, uh, because it's more difficult to operate. It can uh, grow much larger before uh, detection and it can behave more aggressively. While it's in the appendicular uh, location, we use the terminology of atypical cartilaginous tumor. 
histological criteria are very difficult uh, and that's why we do not have uh, a much better or I could put it in another way um, uh, it's very important to weigh the size of the cartilage in this cap uh, and the cutoff is at two centimeters and there's some radiological studies that um, uh, defined this uh, margin so if this is larger than two centimeters then it's very unlikely that it is a, a chondrosarcoma or atypical cartilage in this tumor most of these are low grade, uh, grade two and three are very rare. So this is an example here. We can see the stalk of the uh, osteochondroma and then the, uh, the multiple nodules of cartilage uh, are surrounding this um, uh, stalk. Again, difficult to draw uh, the line. Uh, there are no accepted criteria that we can use, but the principle is more or less the same as for uh, enchondroma. Here you can see some criteria that a pathologist proposed and you can see the cystic changes in the cartilage cap. We can see nodularity, we can see necrosis, we can see extensive calcification, but none of these turned out to be specific for malignant transformation. So they do not help uh, with the exception in my experience of uh, a nodularity. If it's very nodular, uh, you see all these separate nodules, then I think it's usually suspicious of uh, secondary peripheral chondrosarcoma, but then usually the cartilage in this cap is also much larger than uh, two centimeters. So again, an inter-observer variability a study, uh, same um, uh, as done for the central lesions. And you can see again that there is quite some uh, variability and it turned out there were no good criteria. Um, uh, so uh, size is the most important thing, so that's why it should be documented. Nodularity helps and uh, the cellularity should be evaluated in relation to the age. It's if you have a very cellular lesion in an elderly patient, then also you should be suspicious. So to move on to the rare subtypes, uh, <clears throat> periosteal chondrosarcoma, 2% of all chondrosarcomas should be distinguished from periosteal chondroma that I uh, showed before. So here you see an example, again, a cartilage tumor at the surface uh, of the bone here also on the imaging, but you see there is some destruction of the underlying cortex and uh, the invasion of the underlying uh, cortex is an important uh, uh, criterion to distinguish it from periosteal chondroma. And another thing, uh, uh, again, is size. Uh, if the di diameter is larger than five centimeter, then that favors uh, con uh, chondrosarcoma. So again, um, um, it's, it's frustrating that we have to use a criterion like size to diagnose malignancy, but at this point there are just no better uh, criteria. About one third has mutations in the IDH1 gene. And metastases are rare, uh, two out of 36 in the series that we published, and the behavior is not predicted by the histological grade. And this was also shown in a recent paper from the Rizzoli. And so that's why Periosteal chondrosarcomas in our institute are not histologically degraded. This is the uh, epidemiology. Uh, you can see uh, that it again likes the uh, long bones, not so much in the, the short tubular bones. And this is the age distribution, it's quite variable and slight preference for males. The differentiated chondrosarcoma is about 10% of all uh, chondrosarcomas. It's a, a very aggressive uh, lesion with a very poor uh, prognosis, uh, mostly central, uh, and about uh, more than half of the patients have mutations in IDH1 or IDH2. And this is a, a, a typical uh, a case. Here you can see uh, the bluish uh, conventional uh, chondrosarcoma. And then on top of that, you can see uh, a more aggressive uh, lesion that has a different uh, aspect that looks different with hemorrhage and it's more yellow. And you can basically see that uh, also in the imaging. So here's the conventional uh, chondrosarcoma and here's the, the high-grade sarcoma that has uh, arisen on top of this uh, conventional uh, cartilage tumor. And histologically, there's always this sharp interface uh, between the conventional chondrosarcoma and the high-grade anaplastic sarcoma. And here you can see that these patients do uh, very poorly, especially if they're already metastasis of diagnosis. So the epidemiology uh, uh, about equally divided between men and female, it's at elderly uh, age and uh, the long bones and the, the pelvic region are preferred. 
uh, the histology, always this very sharp interface between the two components. The cartilaginous component, uh, according to the books, should be a low grade. Um, however, in daily practice, sometimes also higher grade is seen, but it's still easily recognized as a conventional uh, cartilaginous tumor. And then there is a high grade anaplastic sarcoma, uh, which can be uh, uh, differentiated uh, towards an osteosarcoma, leiomyosarcoma, or even some very rare uh, other sarcomas and even carcinoma has been described. Again, three examples of this very sharp interface. So here, conventional chondrosarcoma and high-grade sarcoma. Here you can see uh, osteoid, so an osteosarcoma next to a conventional uh, chondrosarcoma. And here you can see, uh, uh, this is a, a biopsy. You can see that it might be very problematic if you uh, have a biopsy from the wrong, wrong area. And so this is nice, uh, you have the high-grade anaplastic sarcoma next to the conventional uh, cartilage uh, tumor with the sharp interface over here. However, if you would have only this in your biopsy, then it's almost impossible to um, diagnose uh, the differentiated chondrosarcoma unless uh, with uh, molecular testing you can find an IDH mutation. And then it's a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma. And also your radiologist here is your best friend. Huh? If they document uh, what I showed before, a conventional cartilage tumor in addition to a high-grade sarcoma, then it also uh, may trigger you to diagnose de-differentiated chondrosarcoma and do molecular testing. So the histogenesis, uh, very briefly, uh, for the sake of time. So uh, both components have the same uh, precursor cell, and then there's very early diversion. So uh, the IDH mutation is present really early on. And then the anaplastic component uh, gets additional uh, mutations and alterations becoming more aggressive and separating from the cartilaginous component. Mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is a, a highly aggressive chondrosarcoma considered uh, high grade with a 10 year survival of only 28% and it can metastasize to lymph nodes and other bones and sometimes uh, also after a very long uh, time. And it can also occur primarily in the uh, soft tissue. Um, uh, 14 to 43% uh, is extra osseous affecting the meninges and the lower extremity uh, by preference. This is the age distribution, slightly younger patients, and it can occur in uh, multiple uh, bones. So the histology, typically an undifferentiated small blue round cell sarcoma uh, with uh, areas of a high limb, a mature a cartilage with a gradual uh, transition. And so not the sharp transition that we saw in D-diff sarcoma. However, if you get a biopsy with only the uh, small blue round cell sarcoma, it can be very difficult to diagnose um, uh, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. And then you have a very extensive differential diagnosis as is shown over here, including Ewing sarcoma, small cell osseous sarcoma, et cetera. I think uh, we are all aware of this uh, typical differential diagnosis. So it needs to be worked up properly. When there is no cartilage, it can be difficult to recognize. So here are three examples. So you can see the matrix deposition over here and then the undifferentiated um, small blue round cells over here. You're also the gradual transition. And here you can see the typical HBC-like um, and here also HBC-like uh, vessels uh, the staghorn-like vessels that you can see in mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. And another feature that you can appreciate here is the naked nuclei. So they do not have uh, a lot of uh, cytoplasm. So these tumors are characterized by a specific uh, translocation. Um, uh, and this is shown over here. So between H1 and NCOA2, and there are very rare cases with an alternative uh, translocation. And so this can be used at uh, the, the conventional Archer panel that many labs are using uh, these days, picks up this uh, specific fusion. And so um, hey, if you have a biopsy with only these small blue round cells, it can be very helpful uh, to do a translocation analysis. Last but not least, clear cell chondrosarcoma um, uh, has a typical presentation in the epiphysis, and this is shown over here. So uh, epiphyseal uh, location, um, yeah, well, it speaks for itself. Uh, it's considered a low-grade uh, tumor. It can occur uh, after curettage, uh, also again after a very long uh, time. Uh, and so it has an indolent behavior, but still uh, it can metastasize. Uh, even after 24 years after the primary tumor and uh, especially in the bone. 
long follow-up is uh, usually uh, required for that reason. So the epidemiology, it, uh, as I said, it has a preference for the epiphysis and especially of the, uh, the femur. Uh, as shown over here, and this is the age distribution. These are usually middle-aged uh, patients and a slight preference for males. The typical histology, uh, we see uh, in addition to cartilaginous um, matrix, we also see this very regular deposition of osteoid, as you can see over here. It's very regular, and you also recognize at the low power these osteoclast-like giant cells. Here you can see them more clearly that are also a very prominent feature of clear sarcoma. And in between, you can recognize the tumor cells, so these clear um, uh, cytoplasm of these uh, cells. And then these cells, uh, the nuclei, have usually a very um, uh, a chromatin that's very equal uh, with these small nucleoli that can be very prominent, and then it's usually centrally uh, located. And so this is clear cell chondrosarcoma, quite a, a typical a morphological a picture. And that was what I wanted to share. So uh, that was the last one. So I, I showed you the, the benign ones, the malignant ones, with various types of cartilaginous differentiation, various molecular alterations, and how we can use them to uh, diagnose uh, these lesions even better. So thank you very much. So that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much, Judith. And for giving such a comprehensive talk on chondrogenic tumors. And I'm trying to see, oh yeah, people say it was fantastic, and that people are floating to you. Oh. But now it's time to see whether we have a chance to address to you some questions. So I would just urge to the people to be brave and take advantage of having Judy with us. So any questions related to the talk, to maybe what the talk didn't cover and so on. Yeah, I have a question. Th thank you very much, Judith, uh, by this impressive review. Um, I have a, just a, a question about why do you think it's working well, um, the immunomodulation in specifically the differentiated um, chondrosarcoma subtype. Now we are conducting uh, immunosarc 2 and one of the cohorts is focused just in, in the differentiated cohort, the differentiated chondrosarcoma, because we have seen in the, inter, in the interim analysis uh, that this subtype was the only one working in with anti-PD-1 compounds. So why, why uh, because in the end, the the differentiated component is UPS or is osteosarcoma. Uh, and in these subtypes, the immunomodulation is not, let's say, working a lot. So uh, the, there should be other components at molecular level that could be um, more prone to, to uh, response to, to this specific uh, subset. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, uh, topic. Um, uh, so we, we published some years ago uh, a series of de-differentiated chondrosarcomas where we looked at uh, PDL1 expression and immune infiltrate. Um, and we saw that that was only in the de-differentiated component. So the, the well-differentiated component and all other conventional chondrosarcomas that we tested did not have PDL1 and did not have a lot of immune infiltrate while the uh, de-differentiated component uh, did have a lot of immune infiltrate and pdl one expression, uh, which would suggest that they were amenable to immunomodulating agents, as uh, what you uh, discussed. Um, so that's more or less um, uh, anticipated based on those results. Uh, you can imagine that in the conventional chondrosarcoma head, there's just no room. Yeah? So there's a lot of matrix, so there, the, the, the immune cells can surround the, the nodules, nodules of the, the cartilage matrix, but it cannot enter uh, the tumor, while in the de-differentiated component that can be uh, more prominent. You would expect, though, that if you um, uh, give uh, immunotherapy to um, a, a patient with a de-differentiated uh, chondrosarcoma, that the de-differentiated component will respond, and that in the end, the well-differentiated component will remain. 
So I will be very curious to see whether that would be uh, the case, but still that would be good for the patient because that the, the, the prognosis is determined by the higher grade lesion. In addition to, so, so your second point had that, that uh, UPS um, uh, uh, osteosarcoma had the, the, the subtypes that you can see in the D-differentiated component do not um, uh, do better than uh, when they are solitary, so to say. Uh, it might be that um, the IDH mutation, which is quite frequent in the, these tumors, um, um, adds to the immunogenicity. So that, that could be. There are some um, uh, papers on that in, um, uh, in gliomas. Uh, so that's something that we uh, could explore whether that makes them more um, uh, open to immunomodulary agents. Thank you. Judy, we have questions from the audience. And okay. One is from Dr. Romero Yeuri, and, and he asks for chondrosarcoma, IDH can be detected by Minister Chemistry, or we need to be to run molecular genetics. Yeah, that's a good question. I did not really have time to discuss that in depth. Uh, I showed you um, uh, an example of the R132H mutation, had to show you the, the somatic mosaic uh, pattern. Um, but that's basically the only mutation that can be um, stained for with immunistic chemistry. And so the antibodies that our neuropathology colleagues use are directed against this specific mutation, which is very frequent in brain tumors. Almost all brain tumors have the R132H mutation, while it's very uncommon in cartilage tumors. So only one third of all the mutations and only 50% has a mutation. Um, is R132H, and uh, the most common one is R132C. And for R132C, there is no antibody. So that means that uh, you have to be very lucky uh, if there is a mutation for your immuno to be positive. Uh, so usually uh, I do uh, not use it very often, only very rarely, uh, because uh, it's simply uh, very often false. Uh, negative, and then you need to do molecular testing anyhow. So then it's easier to go to molecular testing right away. So we have a second question from Dr. Ricaetano Oliveira. He's bringing up the issue of a case, which is a case of chondroblastoma that occurred on the phalanx of a male of 56. And it looked like a chondroblastoma, even with a chicken wire classific uh, classification and so on, can happen. Could it be a lesion chondroblastoma like because of the age or what is your experience with these things occurring in a in a not canonical you know setting well occasionally you see chondroblastomas are very rare uh, and unusual locations and occasionally we see that they behave in an unusual way and then it's very nice that now that we have this uh, specific immuno to uh, diagnose them uh, with a very high uh, accuracy uh, because 96% of the chondroblastomas have this uh, specific mutation. So this immuno helps uh, uh, very well. Um, there is also um, a tumor described in the phalanges that has a chondroblastoma-like uh, appearance with um, uh, FN1 alterations, if I remember correctly. Um, so I think here it would be uh, good to have the molecular confirmation to be sure that you're looking at a chondroblastoma at an unusual location. Yeah, right. And another question is related, again, by Dr. Cajano Oliveira. What do you think of MSI in a high-grade sarcoma? Is it worth to evaluate for immunotherapy, or is it as a rare event is not profitable? Yeah, we stained a large series of uh, bone tumors for uh, the mismatch repair genes to see whether there was uh, uh, MSI. Uh, and in, in cartilage tumors, it was basically non-existent. And so um, uh, based on that study, I would not advise to stain for uh, MMR proteins or, or to look at MSI in cartilage uh, tumors. Uh, it is uh, found in a, a low frequency in some other sarcomas, but in cartilage tumors, it was non-existent. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, people start thinking about other questions. I have a more general question for you. Uh, looking back at what, uh, how WHO evolved, to what, how was the, your experience in them in, uh, in writing up the new the new edition? What are the things that are still missing? Things that you are unhappy with? Uh, also, what what do you think are the 
the major plus of what we we did now two years ago almost yeah well, i think the um uh and the way we we defined um uh had a concept of uh, atypical cartilaginous tumor in parallel to atypical lipomatous tumor i think is good I think it's good for patients uh, that they do not get overdiagnosed with cancer while it's 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 treatable with a simple curatage and local treatment. So I think that is good. I think um, uh, it is difficult to get everyone uh, in the field on the same page uh, to 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 uh, get the terminology right. I think it's confusing that uh, the axial and the appendicular skeleton are defined in different ways by orthopedic surgeons. So that's sometimes a bit confusing. But I think we involve the orthopedic surgeons and, and, and they are happy with the classification and, 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 and in the end they need to talk to patients, so that's good. Uh, so I think that is good. I think for what I miss or what I would like to address next time is um, um, I think for the peripheral condosarcomas we did not really properly work it out. And also for the ones in the phalangeal location. So if you see a low-grade lesion in the phalanx that is going through the cortex, we call it chondrosarcoma now, by definition. By, um, but perhaps we should call those a typical cartilaginous tumor as well. Oh, yeah. So that, that's something I think we should specify a bit more um, in the next WHO. Well, thank you so much. So, Javier, David, and many other people, any other questions before we give some please to Judith? Yeah, I would like, so, sorry, because oh. I'm the, in the last second. Uh, oh. Dear yeah. Judith, thank you very much for the, for the review. I think I'm going to see the video again because there were so many concepts I have to, to learn. Um, regarding IDH and its role in, in chondrosarcoma, um, beyond the possibility of target, targets indirectly IDH with a IDH inhibitors which are in development, uh, do you think there is a link between IDH mutations and the reported um, activity of antiangiogenics in some chondrosarcomas? Because not all chondrosarcomas are responding to anti-angiogenics, but IDH could enhance the angiogenic uh, stimulus in the cells. So in my mind, it, this could be an explanation for the activity only in some chondrosarcomas and not in all patients, but I don't know what's your uh, thoughts on that. Um, well, well, first uh, IDH uh, as a target uh, alone. So we did quite some, some preclinical work on uh, targeting IDH in cell lines and, and, and see what, uh, whether we could reduce uh, tumor growth in vitro. Uh, this was actually not um, the case. And so when, when cell lines uh, have been established then there are other drivers than IDH, so you can inhibit uh, IDH and you can downregulate. The, the D2HG, but still cells proliferate. And so it did not really uh, um, help. Uh, there are some papers that do see an effect, but then at very high uh, dosage. And so if you give enough, then the cells start proliferating less, which is which makes sense, but, but it does not really directly target IDH. So it seems that in, in chondrosarcomas that have additional alterations, the um, uh, targeting IDH is not uh, is less effective because the other alterations have become more important in driving tumor growth. Uh, this is supported by uh, the the first study where they did IDH inhibition in in patients uh, by Bill Tapp, I think that published it. Uh, if you look at the molecular alterations and the ones that that uh, did show a hint of response. Uh, are the ones that uh, have the least other mutations. Uh, so that makes sense. Uh, so they, uh, and they are usually also the ones that are not, had not the higher grades that you actually want to treat. And so the lower grades with less mutations respond better to IDH inhibition, which uh, from a biology point of view makes sense. Uh, the link with um, angiogenesis, I'm not really sure. Because um, in, in uh, 
And so, so um, IDH also has an effect on 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 HIFR and alpha, and and in that regard, on on angiogenesis. So there might be a link. Um, however, I have not seen histologically a real difference. Uh, so also, the ones that do not have IDH mutations have um, uh, microvessels surrounding the the lobules. So I wouldn't know that, to be honest. Thank you. Another helpful uh, treatment currently under trial is uh, DR5 uh, agonist, yeah. um, maybe increasing the, the apoptosis reaction. And I don't know if this can compensate the overexpression of BCL2 that we can see in, in some yeah. conventional high-grade chondrosarcoma. What do you think about that? Oh, we have done some studies in the past where BCL, high BCL2 expression uh, um, was responsible for the, the chemo resistance, because eh? if you uh, give a BCL2 inhibitor, then the cells become um, sensitive to conventional chemotherapy. So that definitely plays a role. Um, so yeah, we should see whether um, uh, how these DR5 uh, inhibitors uh, uh, interact with that. I'm not sure. We'll see. Oh, you are muted. Thank you, David. So the question is, what is the experience with laryngeal chondrogenic tumors, chondroma versus low-grade chondrosarcoma? I'm, I, I have my personal view, which is very you know, pragmatic. But anyway, I want to see what you say. Well, we, we have seen uh, uh, a couple of them recently. We even saw uh, uh, last week a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma in the larynx, which is quite uh, uh, rare, but it, it happens. Um, usually these, these uh, uh, lesions are quite obvious uh, radiologically. And so the imaging uh, usually um, will tell you that it is a malignant and not an enchondroma anymore. Um, uh, Personally, I have not seen enchondroma of the larynx because the most of it, uh, the, the tumors that end up under a microscope are the ones that uh, behave uh, more aggressively and that are detected and, and uh, behave in a malignant way. Um, for laryngeal uh, chondrosarcoma, it was also shown that histological grading does not predict behavior. Uh, so we also do not uh, histologically grade those. I'm so happy. Exactly the same experience and view. Another question, does TERT promoter mutation status be a prognostic marker of future targeted therapy in Condosarc? Uh, it has been shown to be prognostic in uh, some of the recent papers. Um, so yeah, that might be. Yeah, I don't know. And maybe it's necessary that you go back a bit to that uh, different, I mean, it's not a differential diagnosis between enchondroma <laughs> And a typical cartilaginous tumor. I mean, some say, say, okay, some people call ACT, but some people call the same thing in chondroma. We know it is challenging, but in the end, maybe it's made clear that the, the change in terminology, I mean, doesn't, that they're still different. I mean, that's what I mean. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I, what I have realized over the, the past years and, 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 and having these discussions at the WHO, but also when we made the uh, AFIP uh, atlas with uh, Peter Nielsen and uh, Andy Rosenberg, is that on different sides of the ocean, uh, we sometimes use different um, uh, criteria and, and, and different terminology. And that is uh, confusing and that's not what we want and that's why in the, uh, the WHO we try to define it as, as, as uh, good as possible uh, but as I said it is a spectrum and there is inter-observer variability and even though we define the criteria as, as good as we can um, still um, yeah it's, it's and we're not computers so uh, yeah well, by the way I take the opportunity to strongly recommend to everybody to buy and read the new FAP on bone and tumors that Judy did is because it's really fantastic. Congratulations, it's wonderful. Any other questions? 
I, uh, I, I have a question and uh, many thanks for this presentation. Um, I was wondering um, um, on uh, the differentiated chondral sarcoma, there is a, again, there is a huge debate on uh, the role of adjuvant chemotherapy. And um, so in uh, Eurobos study, the survival was uh, quite uh, good. So we have the, uh, as compared with historical series, uh, uh, in which it's around 27% was up to 49. So I was one, and then uh, th there is a recent uh, SEER data uh, with um, overlapping uh, survival, so with no detail on chemotherapy. I just wa was wondering which is your own uh, impression if you if your center attitude is to give chemotherapy, to adjuvant chemotherapy to, to the differentiated chondrosarcoma without uh, uh, metastasis. Uh, yeah, we, we uh, well, it depends on, on the patient and the condition and the age, of course, and uh, the margins and everything. But uh, we tend to, to give chemotherapy and exactly what you said, as in ret retrospective series, there seems to be some benefit uh, for these patients. There are many other congratulations here coming. You have to know we have approximately 100 people connected to to listen to you. Also in the chat, you will find the, the website where you can find all the uh, scientific material that has been presented during these educationals. And I'm just checking whether there are, there are any other questions from the audience before we all go. Oh, here it is. In relation to periosteal chondrosarcoma at the appendicular skeleton, Given the low, given low chance of metastasis and gray not being prognostic, isn't block the only surgical? Is the in the, the the surgical option anyway? Um, yeah, I, I think if periosteal chondrosarcoma per definition invades the uh, uh, the cortical bone. Um, and in our uh, institute, they're always uh, unblocked or rejected. So, so then they can easily, they go through the medulla, of course. And so they, they don't take away the whole bone, but they, uh, they do an unblock resection. Yeah. So no, uh, no curating or anything. Because it will recur. Yeah. Let's say thank you. Again, I'm trying to stay late, but we are going quickly to the end of the hour, a lot of time. Any other burning question from the audience? No, sounds like we don't have any other questions. I think we had many, many questions. So I have one question to the Stellar board, whether the Costa Rica meeting is confirmed, which is still under discussion. Do we know anything about the Costa Rica meeting? Next yeah, time? it is confirmed. Well, perfect, fantastic. So we know that whoever- It is confirmed and I th I'm not sure if we have already uploaded the new on the web, uh, Marta, with the- Yeah, we have it. Yes. Yeah, we have it. Good. Three and four of November. I know, I know, I know that, but I know whether there is no you know, a full a full program or I mean, anyway, just to get everybody organized, the one who will need, manage to come. Anyway, if Javier agree and Nadia and so on and David and Irene and so on, maybe we can again thank Judith for her fantastic contributions. And maybe David, you can remind us when is our next meeting. I think the, the next one is in September. And uh, I want to take the opportunity to once again on behalf of CELNET, thank you, Judith, for the great presentation. And of course, to Paolo for sharing this session. It was a great pleasure for us to have you all here. And uh, we hope to see you in the next uh, CELNET webinar. Thank you so 13 much. 13 October. In October, the, the next one is October. Yeah, this October. is for the pathology webinar, but next week we also have the MDT, the monthly MDT, next uh, uh, 28. 28th of, of July, July, exactly at four, at four set European time. So, 
wonderful. By, by October, Italy will be would have been collapsed as you know, <laughs> have no government anymore. But anyway, I will try to stay alive. So thank you, thank you. Ciao, Judith. Hope thank to you. see you soon. And thank you, Judy. Thank you again. Bye. Bye bye, Charlie.